song this morning. It's easier to praise God when the lights are shining brightly sometimes than it is when you're in the dark of the midnight, isn't it? Open your Bibles this morning to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8 is where we're going to begin. <clears throat> I'm going to read a little bit past uh, what the text uh, on the the overhead will show you, but uh, we can back up, back up a little, and we'll show them the um, the subject this morning, the title, an education about the enemy, an education about the enemy, and I'll explain why the Lord has led me to deal with this subject this morning. It's not one that I really love preaching about, uh, but it is something that we need to know, and so we'll talk about that. A little further in just a few moments. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, I'm going to read down to verse 11. You follow along. And then we'll go to Ephesians chapter 6 and read some verses there. But in verse number 8, the Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant. And then he gives us a cause for this soberness and vigilance. Because your adversary, and who is it? The devil. Let's try that again. Because your adversary, who is it? The devil, because your adversary, yours, mine and yours. Can I just stop and say something here that we all need to understand? Whatever is the enemy of God and Christ and His truth is my enemy. And it's your enemy too. Now, Satan is a real person. He is a spiritual being, but he is a real person. We're going to talk about that. But it says here that he is your adversary. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. The indication there is, and again, the metaphor is, it's a picture here. Uh, it's picturing an angry lion, a hungry lion that is actually on the hunt. And so he says, as a roaring lion, uh, walking about or walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now the phrase there, walketh about, that walketh, it means he is constantly on the prowl. He never sits still. He never sits idle. He is constantly on the chase. He's constantly on the hunt, seeking whom he may devour. He says in verse number 9, whom resist, and who's it talking to? It's talking to us. Believers, the people that are the enemies of Satan, were to resist him. Whom resist steadfast, constantly. But here's the only way we'll be successful. Listen, in the faith. None of us are a match for the devil, period. I mean, that's just it. It's plain and simple. I've had in my ministry, uh, the span of my ministry, I've been in ministry now for over 30 years. And uh, in that time frame, I've had a couple of different people that have said to me, I'm ready for anything the devil has for me. I've never seen a person survive that yet. Amen. Don't ever make that statement. You're not ready. I'm not ready. You know what? When the devil comes knocking on the door, you better send Jesus to answer it. Amen. And uh, the truth is, we're no match for Satan in our own strength, but greater is he that is in us than, than he that is in the world. So we need to have a humility about us when it comes to this matter of fighting the devil, resisting Satan. Uh, and the only way to do it is in the faith. He says, knowing that the same afflictions, guess what? Living the Christian life is going to be filled with afflictions. It's not an easy road that we travel as believers. You say, why is that? Well, because we're going the opposite direction of Satan, and, and he's the one that controls this world system. And so you think he's going to make it easy on you? You think he's going to make it easy for you to try to do right? Absolutely not. Now, will we have some wonderful things and great things? And like today, being in church and enjoying the fellowship of one another and the blessing of God, man alive, yes, we'll experience all those. But don't expect it to be all sunshine and roses. Uh, uh, what is they call it? Uh, uh, lemon do drops and gum drops, you know. Uh, don't think that it's just, it's a battlefield. And so... He said there will be afflictions here. Uh, there, and when these afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But, and by the way, the afflictions are only in this world. We're going to a place someday as believers where there will be no afflictions. Amen. Nothing there that offends. Verse number 10. But the God of, listen, listen to these words, of all grace. Oh, I'm thankful we have a God of all grace. Amen. He says, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that ye have suffered a while 
make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You've got an enemy, and when you resist Him and live for God in spite of that enemy, in spite of the afflictions, in spite of the, the challenges, you're bringing glory to God. Now go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 and 12 is what we're going to look at. This is a passage that we have, have memorized. I'll back up and read verse uh, 10 as well. But he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able, here it is, same theme that Peter was just talking about, the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit writing the same theme. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Stand against. Stand against the wiles, the trickery, the, the wickedness of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, uh, God began to work in my heart about preaching on this, and I was telling the Lord, well, we're in stewardship. I got this great message on giving. I want to preach to our people, Lord. I, I just and, and God said, you got time for that. You know, and I know I don't have an audible conversation with God, but I actually I do. I talk to him. I don't hear him say something audibly to me, uh, but I get in his word, you know, and that's how he speaks to me, and that's how he'll speak to you. Uh, but I really felt led to preach on this subject, especially in light of some recent events. Many of you probably know what I'm talking about, but if you don't, one of our church members sent me a little clip, a news clip, uh, about this incident at Chimney Rock Elementary. And I'm telling you, it just got all over me. Uh, and, and even more so, I can't imagine why any parent with a brain in their head would allow their child to attend this thing. But anyway, listen, he, recently an elementary school in Memphis became the host location of an after-school program uh, or club called the Satan Club. Now, you know, there was a time in America, if I'd have read that to a group of people in our church, uh, in any church in America, there would have been a gasp. But the reality is, we're not surprised today, are we? And that's unfortunate. It says here that, uh, well, the CBS News posted an article about it on uh, uh, December 14, 2023. This is what their article said. An after-school Satan club plans to begin offering activities to children at a Tennessee elementary school following Christmas break. By the way, this is their only fifth club in the nation. It says uh, in the article, officials said, and the move immediately proved controversial. Praise the Lord. At least there was controversy. The Satanic Temple, that's who's sponsoring this. And by the way, that's the same group that is lobbying in Texas to be able to have abortions, and they claim that it's for religious purposes to sacrifice the children to Satan. And they started that after, you know, the, we made some strides on getting rid of abortion. So this group, the Satanic Temple, plans to host the club at Chimney Rock Elementary School in Cordova. News outlets reported this. <clears throat> it will be, begin meeting on uh, January the 10th in the school's library and run through the spring semester, according to an announcement Tuesday posted on social media. The article went on to say, and by the way, back up to that other clip, that's their mascot. Uh, you'll see this is their mascot. That's the way they view this club quote unquote, views the devil. Now can I tell you something? The devil doesn't look like that. Amen. He doesn't look like, uh, he also doesn't look like the guy that used to be on the deviled ham, you know, the, the can, you know, with the forch, uh, pitchfork and the tail and all that. He doesn't look like that. You know what Satan is? He's a smooth talker. And he looks good and everything that he tries to draw people away from Christ with looks good too. And I want to tell you something. There's going to be a lot of people one day that are going to regret that they were fooled by the wiles of the devil. Um, the article that went on to say a flyer about the club says the satanic temple is a non-theistic religion that views Satan. Now listen, think about it. Can kids understand this? No. He says they view Satan as a literary figure who represents a metaphorical construct. 
Now, what third grade kid understands any of that language? Don't worry about the devil. Don't worry about that being the name of our club because we're just using it as a metaphorical construct. You know, anyway, y'all pray for me as I preach this message. I'm so mad, I'm telling you. We ought to be mad at the devil. We ought to be mad about this kind of garbage. It says here, rejecting, uh, let's see, this metaphorical construct, listen, of rejecting tyranny and championing the human mind and spirit. You know what that is? It's existentialism. You know what it stems from? Evolutionism. I mean, it's just a domino effect. It's a flow downward, away from God, into hell. That's what it is. And that's what Satan wants. Sorry, I told you I'm upset. (laughs) It says it doesn't attempt to convert children, listen to any religious ideology, but offers activities that emphasize a scientific, rationalistic, non-superstitious worldview. You saw their mascot. Well, the Satanic Temple did launch their club at Chimney Rock Elementary in spite of protests from parents, pastors, and even school board officials. They were able to do this because of the First Amendment and other legal precedents on clubs. In defense of their rights, they cited the, the Good News Club that already meets at the same school. Thank God for that Good News Club. You know, I may not agree with everything about the Good News Clubs, and I know they don't necessarily use the King James Version and things like that, but I am so thankful that they have a presence of light in these public schools. I'm thankful for what our Gideons do and getting the Bible into these public schools. I'm thankful for the Christian teachers. Now, this message doesn't mean everybody that has a kid in a public school or everybody that teaches or serves in a public school is wicked. I'm not saying that. Thank God for those Christians that are a light in the school system. I know some wonderful godly people that work in those systems. Uh, One man that we all know personally, Brother Thorne, really went through a pretty difficult process because of his worldview, because he was a Christian. And they attacked him. And uh, anyway, uh, it's just amazing. We've seen this. And thank God for those who hold the light in these systems. But anyway, here's something that you and I need to think about. They're using these legal precedents and this First Amendment to their advantage. We ought to do the same. And uh, you may hear me say that again in a moment. But anyway, uh, here's the statement from the Satanic Temple website concerning their motivation and the difference between their club and similar evangelical clubs for children. And they emphasize this evangelical club. It says this is right from their website. And boy, I felt filthy after being on their website, by the way. But I felt like I needed to go there and check it out. The After School Satan Club. And, and by the way, if they just want to offer kids a good time and have games and so forth, why? Why in the world call it the Satan Club? I mean, I just don't even get it. They're so blind, they're representing someone they don't believe exists. Now, here's what their website says. Sorry, the After School Satan Club does not believe in introducing religion into public schools and will only open a club if other religious groups are operating on campus. There's their big motive. By the way, how many of you understand the fact that evolution is a faith-based belief? Nobody saw what happened. If you are an evolutionist, that is your religion. And I've never believed in evolution, and I never will. I don't believe in some form of evolution. I don't believe in a little bit of evolution. I believe in absolutely no form of evolution. I understand there are things that take place. There are changes and so forth in species and all that within species. But there is not evolution. There's no evidence for it. And yet we've sold this lie to children for decades in our nation now. They kicked God out and invited Satan in. It's simple as that. Well, he goes on to say the, uh, the After School Satan Club exists to provide a safe and inclusive, key word by the way, that tells you they're, represented, they're representing the LGBTQ community. When you read that word inclusive, you just be prepared because that's, that's a, a code word for their movement. He says they're inclusive alternative to the religious clubs. Listen that use threats of eternal damnation to convert, uh, to convert school children to their belief system. 
I just, you know, somebody guided by Satan came up with this statement. Now, the truth is, here's the reality. You know, if you go to a doctor and you are eat up with cancer and he's got something that can actually help you, but he decides, you know, I'm not going to tell him about the cancer. I just don't want to ruin their day. And it, it sounds so threatening to say you've got cancer. Uh, so I, I'm just gonna, we're just going to act like it doesn't exist. Now, what would you say about that doctor? He's a wicked individual especially if he can help you and chooses not to. Listen, when you tell people the truth, even though it's something that seems threatening and scary, I'm so glad I heard a preacher when I was six years old get up in a pulpit and thunder about people that die without Christ, go spend eternity in a place called hell, and they never get out. I'm glad I heard that. Because if I hadn't heard that, I might not have ever gotten saved. You know what? I ought to be afraid of going to hell. You ought to be afraid of going to hell. I mean, there is nothing about hell that should be appealing to anyone. And uh, uh, they, they say we threaten children. That is a lie. Uh, you know, if you go to one of these good news clubs, I guarantee not one of them gets up and teaches a message on hell. You know what they do? They tell about the love of Jesus. They tell about how you're a sinner and that if you don't trust Christ, uh, you will be separated from Him forever in a place called hell. But I don't think they threaten the children. Anyway, I, it just, it, I'm reading from their website. <clears throat> it says, unlike our counterparts who publicly measure their success in young children's, and this is in quotes, professions of faith. I believe this was written by one of these people that probably left the church. You know, we got a whole movement right now. People that believe that because their parents took them to church, they were being abused because they heard the truth of the gospel. They're being abused. There's fundamentalist recovery groups and things like that now. Anyway, I went to college with a guy that started a, a religious recovery group. I'm not even going to say any more about it. <laughs> anyway, professions of faith. The After School Satan Club program focuses on science, critical thinking, creative arts, and good works for the community. Now think about this for just a moment. This is, that statement is full of existentialism, by the way. The greatest literary work in the history of mankind. If they want to talk about critical thinking, why not expose children to it and let them make a decision? You know why they don't want to do that? Because they know that light leads to light. Truth leads to understanding. And that leads to Jesus and it leads to people getting saved. Now again, I'm angry about this, but I don't want to be angry at these people. They're just blind and lost. I'm angry with them because of what they're doing, but really I'm angry at the devil. Amen. It says here, it goes on to say, and I, I need to keep going. We'll never finish this message today, by the way. But um, it says, while engaged in all these activities, we want club goers to have a good time. The following social media post was sent to, the, uh, to me via a screenshot by a pastor in East Tennessee. And it's uh, the Chimney Rock. That's where this picture comes from, by the way. This is the Satanic Temple's uh, post after the start of the club. And just listen to this. Our very first after school Satan Club meeting in Tennessee was a huge success. Students had fun playing with Legos and coloring books and constructing marbles, uh, marble tracks to learn about kinetic and potential energy. Parents and families were thrilled to meet other like minded people in their community, and everyone is excited for their. Uh, next meeting. We're immensely grateful to everyone who supported our club launch by sending items from our Amazon wish list. Uh, your support means the world to us. Well, as believers, we need to take note of the fact that these people are taking every advantage, as I said. I knew I would read this later in the, in the introduction, but they're taking every advantage afforded them to, to reach children with their false teaching. And we need to do all that we can to do the same. <clears throat> I just can't imagine someone trying to lead a child away from Jesus. 
that just bothers me so much. And there's so many children all around Memphis and Bartlett that need Jesus. Now, this is where secularism has led us. <clears throat> this is what we can expect in a post-Christian world. As believers, we need to know the truth about Satan. Our view of Satan must not be shaped by the world. Our view of Satan must be built on the truth of Scripture. And that's what I want to preach to you about today and maybe next Sunday as well. But we have an outline, and I want to go ahead and just give you the whole outline, then come back and start to deal with these different uh, parts of the outline. First of all, we have the reality of Satan. The reality of Satan. He is real. This group is, is acting like Satan does not exist. I mean, what they're doing here, it's like playing Russian roulette with a fully loaded revolver. I mean, honestly, that's what they're doing. And uh, it is that wicked. So the reality of Satan... And then secondly, the rebellion of Satan. We're going to talk about uh, where he started and what happened, as he, uh, why he's different now than he was when he uh, was created, which he is a created being. And then number three, the resolve of Satan, Satan's resolve. He is determined to do all the damage he can with the time that he has left on this earth. And then finally, we should have a resolution concerning Satan. And that's where we're headed with this outline. I don't think we'll make it all the way through it, but we're going to do our best. So I want to pray with you, and then we're going to come back and deal with the reality of Satan. Father, we commit this service to you. And Lord, I pray for those boys and girls that were sent by their parents to that club. Uh, God, help them. I pray that their parents' eyes would be open, that the children's eyes would be open. I pray for the sponsors of the club, the people that are doing this, that they, their eyes would be open. Lord, I pray that you would just put a stop to this wickedness there in that elementary school. And uh, God, we just ask you to help people realize Satan is real. Uh, and Lord, realize that you are real. And that without Christ, they spend eternity separated from you in a place called hell. Satan's desire is to take as many people to hell with him as possible. And Lord, your desire is that all people would repent and come to faith in Christ. That's what you say in your word, Lord. And so I pray that you would help us. Help us to understand our enemy so that we might be willing and ready to resist him and to stand up for Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice with me, first of all, why should we believe in the reality of Satan? I believe, number one, because the Bible declares him. The Bible declares him to be real. There is no question about it. And I want to give you several passages. We're not going to be able, for sake of time, to look at these. But uh, these are passages that deal with Satan. Every Old Testament book, pretty much, has something to do with the devil or has some concept of Satan within it. Uh, we see evidence of his presence in every Old Testament book. Uh, and these following passages, I'm going to give you six of them that really are some places that you will begin to learn about Satan and his tactics. Genesis chapter 3, of course. Again, we're not going to have time to turn there right now. We will a little bit later on. But Genesis chapter 3, uh, there in the Garden of Eden, I believe that was when he launched his rebellion. I believe it began in heaven, and then he immediately brought it to earth. I believe he was very logical and methodical in what he was doing, and he had a whole plan laid out. And as soon as he rebelled against God in heaven and gathered the third, the, I believe the third angelic host that he was over and brought them under his leadership in that rebellion, I believe he came immediately to earth, and that's when he tempted Eve. And all of this kind of happened uh, very close in time, I believe. But anyway, Genesis 3 describes the fall. And in Genesis 3, he took the form of a serpent and tempted Eve. And you see the tools that he used there. He used doubt. He cast doubt on the word of God there when he tempted Eve. He said, yea, hath God said. And then he used deception. He lied about what sin would actually do. And these are the tools that he really uses. And he used the tool of desire. It's built within man. Eve looked upon that food, that fruit that God said no to, and she saw that it was to be desired. And so he used those tools very successfully against Eve. And, and he's still using those tools successfully uh, on us sometimes as well. 
And so Genesis chapter 3, we see him in the form of a serpent. Now that title serpent is carried all the way through the scriptures. You see it here in Genesis 3 and you see it in Gen uh, Revelation chapter 20 whenever we see him being dealt with in the end of time. He's referred to there as that old serpent. The word old there indicates the, the ancient wicked serpent there that he's talking about. Uh, so Genesis 3, he was the form of a serpent. Then 1 Chronicles 21 and verse number 1, we see there that he tempted David to number Israel. He put a thought of pride in David's heart. He moved upon David and encouraged David to do something that God would not want him to do. And so again, a technique that he still uses today. Then we see him in Job chapter 1 and 2. And Job chapter 1 and 2, and this is encouraging, but you understand that it's a little frightening too to think about this. But Satan, of course, has access to God. He still communicates or still can talk to God, at least here in Job 1 and 2 we see that. And he goes to God and he has to get permission from God to attack Job. Now Job was a godly man. We've been going through that in our class. Uh, by the way, read Job 37. It talks about this weather we've been having. And I couldn't wait to teach it. We'll get to that next week, Lord willing. But <clears throat> he has to get permission from God to be able to attack Job. And here's the reality of that. Everything you go through as a Christian is first father filtered. Satan can't get to you without permission from your father. And that's an encouraging truth. And so we see Job, we see Satan in the book of Job. We see Satan in Isaiah uh, chapter 14, verses 12 through 17. There he's called Lucifer, and his fall is described in Isaiah 14. We see him in Ezekiel cha chapter 28, verse 11 through 19. And by the way, in Ezekiel, you see his influence over the affairs of man. We see him influencing a certain king there. But he, his creation and fall are described in Ezekiel 28. Two foundational passages about the devil, Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19, and Isaiah 14, 12 through 17. Those are very foundational for your understanding of who Satan is and what his goals are. Ze Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, his work as an accuser is described there. It's when he accused Joshua, the high priest uh, of, uh, of sin. And talked about his dirty garments and God changed his garments. And thank God that's what he does for us when we get saved. When we accept Jesus Christ, we're robed in his righteousness like Isaac mentioned in the song earlier. So every writer of the New Testament also deals with Satan to some degree or another. Uh, there are several New Testament passages. Let me give you several of those. Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. You know that story, right? It's when Jesus was led up in the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted of the devil. And in that passage, we see Satan there as the tempter. He tempts Christ to do evil. Uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 3, we see Satan there uh, filled the heart of two churchgoers. Now, I personally believe that Ananias and Sapphira were probably saved people, but they were deceived by the devil. Now, I can't prove that scripturally. Uh, and it's, I don't argue with somebody if they say, no, they weren't saved at all. But they lied, the Bible says, by the, the, the whole, I mean, they lied to the Holy Ghost because of the influence of Satan concerning their offering. Uh, Acts chapter 5, we don't have time to read it, but Acts 5, 1 through 3, somebody says, oh, I'm glad to be in church. The devil's out there and I'm in here. No, Satan loves to come to church. He loves to come to church. Man, he likes, to, <clears throat> one of the, he loves to spend time in a congregation causing problems. He wants us to be upset over things that don't matter. He wants us to ignore stuff like what's going on at Chimney Rock and get offended because something didn't go our way at church. He wants us to be more focused on something stupid so that we are not focused on getting God's truth out. And uh, so you mark it down. Satan does come to church. <laughs> I, I pray that he doesn't. I pray that he won't be able to. But I can tell you, sometimes he rides to church with me. I know he's in the car. <laughs> And so uh, he is always trying to cause problems in church. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15. There we see that he transforms himself into an angel of light. And those that, he rep, uh, that represent him do the same. They're transformed as well. This describes his great work of deception. And my, he's done a good job of it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. His end time deception and desire are described. And literally the whole world... At, that, at one point other than the remnant of saved people are deceived by Satan. 
and they will literally worship his representative. And so you have it there. Uh, and this world's being prepped for that right now. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12. Revelation 12, 7 through 12. Uh, his war with the angels of God is described. Uh, he is cast out of heaven at that point. No access whatsoever after that. He is called a great dragon. He is called the old serpent. He is called the devil. He is Satan and deceiver of the world, of the whole world, the Bible says there. And then Revelation chapter 20. One of my favorite chapters. Amen. That's right. Revelation chapter 20. His end and eternal punishment are described. Unfortunately, we read there about those who have been deceived by him. Their final judgment at the great white throne judgment is described there as well. Now, why? Why believe in the reality of Satan? Because the Bible declares him to be real. Can I tell you something, folks? When science contradicts this book, I'm going to choose this book. When a politician contradicts this book, I'm going to choose this book. When my own carnal desires contradict this book, I pray God will help me choose this book. Amen. And so the reality is that there is a devil because the Bible says so. But not only that, we believe there's a devil because Jesus confirmed his reality. Jesus said there's a devil. Uh, and so there's a couple of things. Go to Matthew chapter 13. We'll look at this in some detail. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And you have here a story that Jesus shares, a, a parable, if you will. And uh, the parable is a, it's really a, a fictional story based on uh, real truth. And what it does, a parable is something, the word parable literally means to, to throw alongside. And so what, what the parables do is they throw an earthly illustration alongside of a heavenly truth. And that's what Jesus is doing here. So in chapter 13, verse 36, he gives the parable. And uh, let's see here. Matthew chapter 13, verse number 36. I'll find it here in a minute. Then Jesus went uh, Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Now, if you want to read that whole parable, you have to back up uh, to 24 through 30 of the same chapter. We're just going to deal with this section here. He says in verse 37, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Now, who's the son of man? Jesus. That's a reference to Christ. The field is the world. So there's seed being sown in the world. Okay, it's either going to be sown by uh, the Son of Man or Satan, and we'll get to that. He says the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Well, who's the wicked one? The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. It's a frightening thought, but it is a reality that we live in. The word enemy here refers to, in verse 39, refers to a hateful adversary. Then he is identified in the same verse as the devil. The word devil is the word diabolos, meaning slanderer. He is the enemy of God and the accuser of the brethren. He is the one that sows tares among the wheat. He's the one that wants to deceive the world to keep them from receiving the gospel. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, turn there. You see the Lord Jesus here teaching about the devil. Now in Matthew 4, we see him confronted by the devil. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, this is the temptation of Christ. It says here, Then <clears throat> was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now Luke indicates that Jesus was tempted the entire time he was there. But I want you to note something. It seems that Satan came against Christ in his weakest moment. And he loves to do that. He's compared to a lion. You know what a lion loves to do? He loves to single out that weak, uh, that weak animal that's a part of the group, but uh, maybe falling behind the herd, so to speak. That's who Satan goes after, that one that's in their moment of weakness. Now, let me just tell you, as a believer, 
You know what your weaknesses are and you know when those weaknesses are the worst. And so guard against those. Be cautious. Reach out to someone and ask them to be your accountability partner. Reach out to someone when you're going through a time of weakness and despair and say, hey, I need you to pray with me and pray for me. And so we can uh, accomplish more together, by the way. So we see here in Matthew 4, verse 1, uh, uh, where did I get to? Verse number 3, it says, And when the tempter came to him, notice that title there, the tempter, came to him. He said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, what would you be thinking about if you'd been fasting for 40 days? Man, I'd love to. You know, you think about in church, you ever... Uh, if we're having a meal at church and they're cooking already in the kitchen and about time for church to let out, you can smell the aroma, right? I don't usually eat breakfast on a Sunday morning, so when I smell that, it's like, oh, my sake. It's all I could think about, you know? Imagine how Jesus must have felt during this time of temptation. Now, let me tell you something. When an evil thought comes into your mind, don't play around with it. Don't even give it time to settle in. What is it? Somebody said you, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep him from build, building a nest in your hair. And, and we have to be cautious about these thoughts. Satan is trying to put a thought into Jesus' mind. Now, was bread wrong? No. But it wasn't the right time for Jesus to have bread. And when it's Satan that's offering it, even if it's something you say, well, this isn't wrong. But when it's Satan that's offering it, guess what? You better run away from it because there's a hook in the bread somewhere. Amen. And so he says, uh, man, Jesus responds here. Man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And by the way, we learn from Jesus here. When you're confronted by the devil, you need to respond with the word of God. Verse 5, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and settleth, uh, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. You see another tactic of the devil. He's using scripture here. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. He's quoting scripture to Jesus. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He used scriptural truth against Eve, and he's using scripture here. It says in verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I always think of that phrase whenever people talk about going bungee jumping. Amen. If you're a bungee jumper, I don't mean to offend you, but that's what I always think about. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And, and you know what else I think about when people, uh, churches handle snakes. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> and so he says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse number eight, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Now, you make sure you pay attention to this. Because Jesus does not rebuke him and say, you don't own those. Notice what Satan says to him about all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. It says here, and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And Jesus responds here again with the word of God. Get thee hence, Satan, get behind me, get away from me. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You see here in Matthew chapter 4, much of the technique of Satan. He pulled out all the stops. He did everything he possibly could to attack the Lord Jesus and cause him to sin. The Bible tells us that Christ was tempted in all points like as we are, listen, yet without sin. He knows how to succor or draw you or help you during your time of temptation as well. Here in this text, Matthew 4 verse 11, the phrase the devil is used four times. He's called the tempter once. That word tempter, the words, the meaning behind that word. And by the way, tempter is uh, it's one of his primary goals against the believer. But it means uh, to obtain information, to be drawn into sin is the idea behind it. But behind that word, the, the root meaning of it, to obtain information, to be used against a person by trying to call someone to make a mistake, to trap them. He's the accuser of the brethren. 
He's, the word Satan is used here too, and that's the Aramaic word for devil. When Peter, uh, when Peter told Jesus he would not let him go to the cross, one more illustration there. Turn to Matthew chapter four, uh, 16. Sorry, Matthew chapter 16. When Peter told Jesus he would not let him go to the cross, notice Christ's response in Matthew 16, verse number 23. Jesus said unto Peter, he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, what's the next word? Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You see, here is an instance where a believer fell under the influence of the devil. My point in sharing that with you is this. We need to be aware of the fact that we, as believers, can be influenced by Satan. And we need to guard against that temptation. Now, we're going to have to stop right here. Which it's 11.35 already. Uh, but the reality of Satan is clear. He is real. This group that has this club set up, they say, oh, we don't believe in him, therefore it doesn't matter. Can I tell you, if you don't believe in gravity and you jump off the Empire State Building, guess what happens? Gravity happens. And they're just deceived. Now, <clears throat> let's go back to our starting verses. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, and uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 10. And this is what I want to bring up every time I preach on this until we get finished. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. We as believers are charged to be sober, to be vigilant. Can I ask you, are you sober and vigilant today? Are you sober and vigilant throughout the week? That means you're clear-minded. And let me explain something about that. It means that you understand what you're in. You understand who Satan is. You understand that you have weaknesses. You understand that the devil wants to exploit them. So you're sober-minded. You're thinking clearly. But you're also vigilant. You are ready for the fight. That means you put on the armor. And I believe the indication there is that you've been in the Word of God. When you get in God's Word every morning, you spend time in prayer, I picture that in my mind as a Christian that is putting on the armor. So he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking who may devour, whom, listen, resist. Resist steadfast in the faith. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 10. The verse there, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, here's my invitation. Would you please join me in resisting the devil and standing for Jesus? That's really what we're called to do as believers. And, and you know what? I, I don't want us to be afraid to say, I'm going to resist the devil. I don't want us to be afraid to say, I'm going to stand up for Jesus. We are living in a time right now in America when our nation, our city, our neighbors need to see someone who's going to resist the devil. And that comes up a lot of ways by us not being involved in what the world is promoting. Not being involved in everything the world seems to love. We're resisting that temptation and we're standing up for Jesus. Would you resist the devil today and would you stand up today for Jesus? Would you stand with me this, this morning? We're going to have a hymn of invitation in just a moment. Uh, Brother Isaac is on his way and we're going to sing this morning. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. But let me ask.